So are we out of the worst of this sell-off that we've been looking at for global recession worries? Is the market back to everything being okay? And is the soft landing back on? Well, maybe not so fast. Welcome to Macro Money. This is Ilya Spivak, head of Global Macro here at Tasty Live. And we're going to look at what is going to drive financial markets in the coming week and why this early respite that we have here on Monday at the start of this week is probably not something that is lasting. As ever, if you're watching this on YouTube, do jump into the comments, share your thoughts. Do you think uh, that we are going into a better or a worse place for stock markets from here, a worse place or still more gains for the US dollar going forward? And we'll incorporate your comments into the show going forward. The question this week, of course, as ever, how badly of a recession risk are markets concerned about? How dangerous is the current environment being perceived? Because as ever, it's not so much about how badly the downturn will be or could be. It's about are markets fearful that something unexpected is on the horizon? And here, we turn our attention first and foremost to U.S. economic data, probably the um, focal point this week. And there, the main event, not surprisingly, the inflation data uh, that is going to be with us on Wednesday. Uh, this is going to be August's U.S. CPI report. And here, what we're looking for is an interesting kind of situation. For the second month in a row, we are expecting to see that core inflation, the bit that excludes energy and excludes food, is going to go down while the headline number, which includes energy and includes food, is going to go up. That we are going to move further away from the Fed's target, if you look at the headline, but closer to it, if you look at the core. And this is, of course, a very interesting set of developments, because as we see here in the breakdown of what is the primary driver of U.S. inflation at this point, it is not energy. It is not food. And goods inflation has been squeezed to essentially nothing. The real culprit here is so-called core services. Now, the biggest component of core services actually driving inflation is housing services. So those things used to maintain homes, most primarily for owner occupiers. And this ought to make sense. The average mortgage rate out there that one could have now is north of 7%. The average mortgage rate on existing outstanding mortgage debt in the U.S. is 3.6%, so almost 4% lower. And that's because people mainly have 30-year fixed-rate mortgages, and so they locked in rates at much lower mortgage rates than what's out there now. Not surprisingly, nobody wants to be a seller, and inventories are aggressively low, down to barely a million homes for existing homes. And so what we have here is a tremendous amount of inflation in housing services because people don't want to sell, they don't want to move, they want to stay where they are to keep their low mortgage rates in this environment. So what you end up with is quite a bit of housing services inflation. But there's not really very much that the Fed can do about that. They're certainly not going to uh, make the housing market clear supply demand imbalances in any kind of hurry in an environment where it has itself driven mortgage rates this high and thereby essentially locked the housing market into a state of pretty much utter illiquidity. Existing home sales are overwhelmingly the biggest component. New home sales are 
lower by perhaps a fraction of five or a fraction of six times less. And so while we may get more new homes built here over the course of the next six to 12 months, there certainly seems to be a pickup in building permits and housing starts. To actually unstick the price of homes and to start to create some activity here that might re reduce housing services inflation is probably going to take quite a long time yet. You, you, you're going to need a tremendous amount of this supply to come and actually unstick this market. So not a whole lot the Fed can do there on its own timeline, but to actually let inflation out of the bag by rate cuts, which it clearly is not going to do. That would be counterproductive to precisely its goals. So then the Fed turns its attention to the labor market. And this is really where it has been mostly focused. Now, we can see here in the yellow the employment cost index. And we can see that it has fallen much less than has overall inflation. Inflation has come down uh, from 9.1% to now below 4. Core inflation has come down from just under 7 to next to 4. While employment cost has only come down from 5.1 to 4.5%. It's moved less than a percentage point. And that's because we still have this lingering disparity in the labor market. You can see here the difference between supply and demand is still relatively high. We're still looking in U.S. labor markets at a shortage of just about 3 million jobs. That's the difference between supply and demand here, the blue bars that you see pointing below zero. And that, of course, keeps wages sticky, because if there are many more jobs that people want to have employees in, then there are employees to have them, and the only way to compete there is on price. So wages go up. Now, the Fed has basically taken it upon itself to beat back this part of the equation by slowing the economy, raising interest rates, making it more expensive to borrow, thereby attempt to reduce economic activity, reduce demand for labor, generate some amount of resetting of wage contracts through layoffs, and thereby to bring wage growth down, which ostensibly is uh, what it can do to get inflation closer to its target of 2%. If we then come out of this inflation number, and what we end up seeing is the headline number goes up because that energy component is getting less negative, and that has been the reason why inflation has been, for the most part, coming down. It's been the squeezing out of goods and the squeezing out of energy. And of course, energy prices have had a fairly robust time at least on the crude oil side of things, in the past two, three months. So if we start to see that continue to feed inflation at the headline, but what happens at core looks better, well, that's going to suggest that the Fed's own efforts are actually working. In fact, we're going to see here that core inflation will dip underneath the employment cost index at least the latest numbers, which, of course, is exactly what the Fed would like to see. It would like to see this part of it unstick. And so the message, ostensibly, out of all of this for markets may not be, oh, inflation is going higher. It may actually be, well, things are getting closer to where the Fed wants them to go. But the reason they're going there is because the economic pain that the Fed wanted to engineer in core services is actually starting to appear. And that, of course, is not good news 
for the growth rate of the economy. If, in fact, this CPI data starts to show that the U.S. labor market is starting to get squeezed, and we've seen that already a little bit in NFP numbers as well as elsewhere, then the story is going to look negative for consumption. People without jobs don't tend to consume as much, after all, and consumption is 70-plus percent of U.S. economic growth. That would speak to a slowdown in the U.S. economy becoming more acute. We're going to get some data pointedly aimed at consumers later in the week. Retail sales expected to slow from 0.7% to 0.1% gain month on month. And if we look at the expectations for the University of Michigan Consumer Confidence Survey, it is expected to tick down at the main sentiment index for the second consecutive month. And ostensibly, it's because current conditions are deteriorating. The expectations index is expected to tick up a little bit, probably because inflation expectations are seen perhaps cooling somewhat now that we've uh, come down over the course of just over a year from nine to just under four. So all of this will fit into the same narrative. If we get data here that's suggesting the consumer is becoming more worried about current conditions, sentiment is starting to weaken. And at the same time, the CPI data suggests that the pain aimed at the labor market has perhaps arrived, well, then we're going to be in a situation where the Fed is less likely to continue to tighten. But that won't be for good reasons. That'll be because the business cycle is turning over in an adverse direction. Now, we can see at this point that we have about a 50% chance of another rate hike before year end. That's in December there. You can see the peak at 50.5%. And the likelihood is still that we're going to get the hike itself in November. So, in other words, the markets are saying there's a slight chance in September. If there's a hike, it's probably in November. If it doesn't happen in November, there's a slight 6.5% chance that it might still happen in December for a cumulative 50.5% chance. But that's just barely there. The cuts expected to uh, begin sometime in May or June, with June uh, the first cut fully in the market. Three of them expected next year, uh, and a fairly meaningful probability for a fourth by end of year next year, about 69% chance that we're going to get a full percentage point shaved off rates next year. And from the market's perspective, because the Fed is so laser focused on inflation, the upshot from data suggesting this is probably about right as these numbers would imply between the consumer sentiment numbers, the retail sales numbers, and the CPI numbers, well, then the U.S. is heading for a nasty, nasty turn in the business cycle. And that's bad news for risk. It's bad news for earnings, and so probably bad news for stocks. To the extent that there is liquidation there, it's probably good news for the U.S. dollar, which tends to be the object of cashing out when markets get spooked. And the Japanese yen may strengthen because this could revive the, the narrative from two weeks ago before the markets got distracted by OPEC last week, suggesting that maybe we get more sturdy rates holding up at the front end, but maybe the back end starts to attract some haven demand. And so bonds do better at the 30-year end of the curve, the 10-year end of the curve, 
but they but they remain near the lows at the two year end of the curve because inflation is perhaps going to be higher at the headline and of course the core is at 4.3 percent even if that would be the case and it would be the lowest reading since um, the second half of 2021 still about double the target of two percent so all of this might well suggest that yes it's possible that the fed could be done here and the evidence might reinforce that idea but not for any reason that the market is going to like next on the docket the european central bank and that's the other big announcement this week they're going to issue their rate decision and as ever they are stuck between a rock and a hard place on the one hand the eurozone economy is at this point almost certainly in recession the past two readings on the composite pmi index uh, here sub 50 uh, just to re remind us 50 is the boom bust level for these pmi surveys above 50 is growth below 50 is contraction the further you go above 50 the faster the growth the further you go under 50 the faster the contraction and so what you see here in the past two months for the composite index which includes both manufacturing and services here is as services catches up on the downside with manufacturing which has been basically in contraction territory and accelerating that way since the middle of last year you now have two consecutive months of the eurozone economy shrinking and doing so at an increasingly rapid speed all of which doesn't seem to scream ecb rate hikes for obvious reasons but when you look at inflation expectations in the eurozone what you find is actually they continue to head higher almost teasing the ecb to do more screaming at them that they're not done because inflation expectations are going the wrong way and as we can see here cpi tends to follow with about a six-month lag thing is though when you look at the actual components of cpi in the euro area what you find is that much of the disinflation so far has come from energy and most particularly gas so you can see that big gray wedge there in the middle of the chart that has been worn down to next to nothing at this point that is for the most part well first of all that's the housing water electricity and gas component but of course the driver there is gas natural gas prices despite the war in ukraine have been cratering and so their influence on inflation has been minimal increasingly that's been the main driver of disinflation that's how we've primarily gotten here to 5.3 percent down from close to 10. the biggest component left here you can see is that pink area which is food now there's not a whole lot the ecb can do with rate hikes to discourage people from eating so there's not a whole lot that they're going to be able to do here by raising rates to address this part of it even more so because this is not really a function of the war in ukraine this is not wheat for the most part which would be the natural kind of food related commodity that's being disrupted actually wheat prices are right there down with natural gas prices and that's generally because russia seems to be flooding the market with its top commodities because it can only raise money but so many ways when it's hampered by sanction and for grains and for energy there are some carve outs so the main culprit here appears to be sugar sugar appears to be near the end of uh, a supply shortage kind of run but in any case even if it wasn't not a whole lot that the ecb can do by raising rates to uh to discourage the eating of sugar so it could be that given the dire economic situation the governing council at the ecb basically decides look this is a wait and see kind of situation 
Why are we going to hurt the economy more? It's already shrinking. Yes, inflation is still high, but monetary policy is cumulative in, in its effects. As rates filter into the economy, the squeeze will be harder. Meanwhile, what are we going to do about sugar? Noth nothing really. So why are we going to hurt the economy more here? Let's just let these higher rates continue to pressure things, and then we'll see how it goes. That, of course, clashes with expectations, where what you are currently seeing is still a 75% chance that we're going to get a rate hike before year end. Now, you can see it's focused on September. This is actually the meeting with the highest likelihood that you would see that hike. So you can see about a 41% chance, less than even, that we would get the hike now. There's a further 25% chance that if we don't get it now, we'll get it in October, and a further 8.9% chance that if we don't get it in either of those two meetings, it'll happen in December. So 40 or 41 plus 25 and a half plus nearly nine, that's how you get this 75 right here in the uh, hikes cuts column for for. December. So these together is how you get this. So the markets are still generally expecting the ECB to go again. That's a well better than even expectation. If the message from the ECB is, you know, actually, we don't really feel a need to uh, be very activist here and back away, well, the euro is likely to suffer. But more importantly, it will suggest that yet another central bank is getting ready to back off because it feels like it's done enough damage to put inflation back on the path toward targets. You add this along with inflation data out of the U.S. and some consumer data out of the U.S. that suggests the squeeze that the Fed has applied is starting to reveal itself and the pain is becoming more apparent, and more and more ingredients in a global recession scenario start to come together. The cherry on top here may well be, once again, China. This week, we're going to get industrial production and retail sales data. The expectations there for modest gains on both fronts, 3.9% on industrial production, 33 on retail sales. And Chinese economic data has tended still to underperform relative to forecasts. This is uh, an index from Citigroup, and you can see that uh, it's still very much below zero, meaning Chinese economic data still tends to undershoot relative to baseline forecasts. So the tendency is still for the actual results to be weaker than these expectations. There is something of a silver lining here, if only just barely so. Since the middle of July, the index has seemingly started to creep higher. But unfortunately, that's not because the data has gotten any better. It seems more because expectations have gotten worse. So you can see, at, in about the same time that this index has started to improve a bit, growth expectations have actually been cut. So it's not so much that the data is getting better, it's that it's undershooting expectations by less of a margin because the expectations themselves have been ratcheted down. And so what you still end up with then is the risk of a disappointing outcome. That disappointing outcome fitting into a narrative uh, for China that has been nothing but trouble since reopening from zero COVID lockdowns in December, because that reopening came over a year, close to a year and a half after China's main customers started to emerge and where their post-COVID growth spurts peaked. You can see that the remnants of stimulus spending and the reopening of, uh, of economies gave us a peak in U.S. growth in May of 2021, a peak in Eurozone growth in July of 2021. And China really only came back to the party in December of 2022. By then, all of those 
catch-up growth spurts had run their course, and both economies were starting to be significantly hampered by aggressive interest rate hikes, as both central banks launched on a battle with inflation. And so China's economy never really got back off the ground, because if your economy is the global value-add center, if the way you have economic growth is you import raw materials and input commodities, and your job is to assemble them either all the way or some of the way, and then to ship them on to the place where they're going to get finished or sold, well, then you need your export demand markets to be there for you. But if they're not, if you're there a year and a half later after their growth has peaked, and they've now spent over a year looking for other supply chains linkages to replace you, because you've been gone, never mind the fact that you've been a little bit more combative and they're generally not happy with you, as we heard from the G20 this weekend, well then, the demand that you need for economic growth isn't going to be there. And that's the story that we find ourselves in with China. It's just not there. Now, the problem, of course, is that when you put all of this together, you end up in a scary world. Between the Eurozone, the US, and China, you have 57% of global GDP growth, and that's before you account for the fact that the remaining 43%, in large part, is made up of vendors to the former three. So think of Canada and the US. Would Canada have economic growth if the US w w wasn't buying 80 plus percent of their exports? How about Australia and China? How about Central Europe and the Eurozone? A ton of the rest of that 43% is dependent on there being robust demand from China, from the Eurozone, from the US. So actually, their impact is even greater than the 57% that this implies. And the data this week may well suggest that the pain has become very acute in all three. Speaking to global recession risk and warning that the turn lower in stocks that we've been watching over the past week, it may well continue. That the strength in the U.S. dollar may well continue as well amid the liquidation that this implies, and that the yen may join the party now because the expectation would be that if there is a global recession, then rate cuts are coming at some point, not too far off. And when global yields come down, that's probably good for the non-yielding yen. Gold prices have been telling, uh, telling the holding up here, even as the U.S. dollar has become stronger, ostensibly around this very idea that despite a stronger dollar, which should hurt gold, interest rates are now expected to be lowered down the road as the economic bite grows more aggressive. And so the markets appear to be starting to respond already to these dynamics. And that is macro money for today. We are, as ever, here just after overtime, a show I do with head of futures and forex here at Tasty Live, Chris Vecchio, where we recap the post Wall Street developments, see how they might shape what's coming up next. That's Monday through Thursday every week, as is macro money, of course. I'm also on with Chris for Futures Power Hour on Fridays, on with Tom and Tony for First Call Sundays, writing for the News and Insights section of TastyLive.com. In fact, a summary of this very outlook is there currently. And opining on Twitter, yes, Twitter, at Ilya Spivak. Thanks very much. Happy trading. Do leave those comments if you're watching on YouTube. See you tomorrow.